Good morning, everyone. Today, we have the luck to have our two speakers here. So first speaker is Filippo. He is the mastermind behind NetGet. So many of you already worked with him uh, yesterday. So he will be explaining a little bit how everything works there. And I guess all those things. <laughs> okay, so the floor is yours. Yes. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah. I work with Giuseppe in, um, in uh, Lausanne together with Patrick and a bunch of other people. Um, I'm the person who has been developing NetKit a lot recently. So the idea of this talk is to be a bit hybrid. I will uh, recall a few concepts that uh, Giuseppe introduced and uh, I will try to go a bit more in detail maybe. And yes, good. Um, the idea is to show you, to give you a kind of hybrid talk, so to show you some concepts and at the same time um, show you how to do it in NetKit live. And the idea is that uh, please do ask questions, uh, please interrupt me. Um, that's the idea of the talk, of the session. And uh, I will assume that you do understand a bit the basics of NetKit and how to at least define an Hamiltonian and the system, but I mean, if it's not clear, just ask away, really it's no problem. So the first uh, topic I'd like to cover today is uh, dynamics of closed systems or closed quantum systems. So Giuseppe talked about it yesterday and he introduced to you the time-dependent variational principle. Um, in short, what we want to do is uh, just to recall a bit, uh, we want to solve the Schrodinger's equation, the Psi over the T, given by the minus the Hamiltonian applied to the state, the cat at a certain time. Um, since we are using neural quantum state or variational states, however you call them, um, we are approximating the wave function, the cat, with a neural network. So instead of having to store the exponentially large number of parameters at every time, we're just storing some a smaller set of parameters. And, and the important thing here is that instead of uh, uh, having a fixed set of parameters that, get, that give me a state now, like the state, uh, like since the state is evolving in time, I, I will parameterize my parameters with, uh, with time. So I want to find some differential equation that tells me how to evolve, how to update my, my parameters and network weights uh, in such a way to reproduce or to approximate the, the, the solution of a shared inverse equation. And basically what we are trying to, to achieve is to write uh, some equation somewhat like that, right? So the way Giuseppe showed it to you, like the way it's done basically is that we start from a state, let's say with a set of parameter W. Um, we, given this state, we can write the exact form of the state at the t plus delta t, at the state evolved with some small time step. And that's given by the unitary time evolution that you know, the exponential of minus i dt times h. Of course, if dt is very small, we can linearize that first order. It becomes identity minus i dt, that's all very simple. So that's the shape of the exact states, right? This, in, in principle, analytically, I can write it. I know that this is the state at t plus delta t. At the same time, I, I can also write the linear expansion to the first Taylor order of, of my neural quantum state, so of my neural network state. Basically, I take a Psi, uh, and instead of writing it as a function of the parameters W, I write it as a function of parameters W plus a small variation delta W. I expand it around W, and I get this expression, where OKs are the log derivatives of my ansatz of my neural network. What you need to retain from this expression is basically that um, if, I, if, I take, if I take the first order expansion, of course, I get the identity. So basically the state itself plus, of course, the derivative, right? That's very simple. And then what I want to do is I want to solve this, uh, to solve this problem. So basically I want to try to find the, the variation of parameters, delta w, that maximizes the overlap between those two states that I wrote above. The, uh, this one, that is the exact state, and, and this one, that is the, uh, 
let's say the, the one where I perturb slightly, I, I update it slightly the parameters. I want to find this variation of parameters that basically matches, maximizes the fidelity um, of, of the exactly evolved uh, state. And uh, if you do a lot of algebra, uh, it's not even too hard. You basically find that you have to solve a linear system of equations. Um, so basically, you have this S k k prime, which uh, Giuseppe introduced yesterday. We call it the quantum geometric tensor because it is the quantum geometric tensor. Um, and and to compute it, essentially, we need to uh, store or compute the log derivatives of my neural network and uh, and, and center them. Um, the, the the key point here is that this quantity um, gives me some, it, it's basically a matrix where, where the size of this matrix, so the, the, the number of, of values that K can, can, can take, it's equal to the number of parameters, but that should be quite clear. At the same time, I have my, the other term is uh, the gradient of E of the energy. It should be also be very clear if you followed through the other lectures. And, and now what I want to do is basically I can symbolically solve this equation, right? So I can say by the, the update, delta W are simply given by S to the minus one, uh, that's the matrix inverse, times the gradient. Of course, solving this linear system is tough because um, S, uh, it's kind of like a metric tensor in the space of my variational state. Um, it, it has several eigenvalues that are zeros, or almost zeros. So you cannot really compute the inverse. You have to use like the pseudo inverse algorithm. And sometimes you have, since we are not computing it exactly, but we are stochastically sampling it, because otherwise uh, the computational cost required to compute it exactly would be exponentially large. Uh, I mean, solving these start to have issues, numerical issues. So a very effective way to solve it is to use uh, what we call linear solvers. So there are algorithms that allow me to find the delta W, the solution to this linear system of equations without really inverting the matrix itself. And, and that's very useful because uh, in general, if my, if my problem is ill-conditioned, there are several eigenvalues that are zeros, these kind of algorithms can perform better than just the pseudo inverse. So once I have solved this uh, linear system of equations and found the update, I simply update my, my parameters using it. Actually, this should be a plus, I'm sorry. Um, and then basically I have the parameters at the next time step and then I can do this over and over again. Now, there's, uh, there's an interesting thing I would like to, uh, to, to underline, to talk about is the fact that uh, depending on whether your ansatz as real or complex parameters. Um, right. Sorry, yes. I have a question. Um, regarding the quantum geometric tensor, um, what kind of information does it provide? Because I was thinking, for instance, uh, relating to Patrick's talk about the Hessian, do it, does this provide information also about the landscape or the curvature of your space or? Okay, so there's a very, um, say, intuitive definition of what the quantum geometric tensor is um, that's related to natural gradient optimization. And it's, it, it's basically the following. Um, so the, you have a neural network and you, you, the parameters of your neural network live in a Euclidean space, right? So like uh, they can assume any value there and you can compute the distance between two sets of parameters, let's say like wi plus one and wi. Um, and the distance is simply the L2 distance that we all know, Euclidean distance. The problem is that um, that's not the quantum distance. That's not the, the distance in the, in the Hilbert space, right? Because if I compute my state for a set of parameters W, W, and if I compute my state, so Psi, for another set of parameter W prime, it could be that the two states are identical because uh, there are degeneracies, but also because like the Hilbert space has, has a phase, right? Uh, like the states have a phase. 
not only that, um, I also, if I change one parameter, I might move very little in the Euclidean space of my uh, of the weights, but I might move very far in the space of of like in the Hilbert space. So basically, the quantum geometric tensor is the metric tensor in the space in the Hilbert space that tells you how to transform from the Euclidean space to the Hilbert space. It's telling you essentially, look, if you, if you give me two configurations in the Euclidean space, I can tell you their distance in the Hilbert space. At least, let's say, a linear approximation uh, if, if those states are close together. Of course, that's a linearization. So it, it would be very nice if it allowed us to have a metric on the whole, uh, whole space, but that's not the case. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so, so what I want to say is the following. Um, so if you, if you do the algebra here, depending on whether your, uh, your, your network, so your, your answer says real or complex parameters, you might find that the equations are that one uh, for complex parameters or one where you see real part of, of both the S, K, K prime term and the, and the gradient term. So the reason for that is that um, there are actually two ways to, to define the, to derive, and to, de, to define the time, uh, like the, the time dependent variational principle, let's say, the variational principle we are using. Um, one is due to Dirac and Frankel, uh, and the other one is due to McLachlan. Um, I will not get into the details of it, but uh, essentially, if you look at it, a here, in, this is uh, taken from a paper. Uh, A here is the quantum geometric tensor, so what I was calling S, and C here is the gradient. So you see that the difference between those two is simply that here, in one case, I'm taking the real part, and in the other case, I'm taking the imaginary part. So um, what I'm trying to say is that if, you, if you're working with complex parameters, like you, you can use the whole Quantum, you need the whole quantum geometric tensor to compute the updates of, of your parameters. Instead, if you work with, uh, in, in the space of real parameters or also with uh, ansatz that are non-holomorphic, which is something that happens, um, you, you essentially can make a choice between one of those two variational principles, depending on whether you take the real part or the imaginary part of the geometric tensor. And, and they're not exactly equivalent in this space. In, in general, we take, uh, we take the McLachlan variational principle, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, we do that, but um, there is this kind of um, degeneracy, so you can do this choice. So with that said, I would like to show you how to actually do this briefly in NetKit, how you can play with this, right? Um, so let's see, can you see that? Um, okay, Philippe, so Philippe, can I ask you a question? Yes. Hi. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if you will do that in the in the tutorial, but when you are doing your the algorithm for in the time dependent case, uh, so in the stationary case, you keep track of the energy and you check that for to see if your algorithm has converged. So in the case of the time dependent, what do you check the overlap of the two the, of the two states? So um, it's harder. So as you said, exactly, like when we optimize for the ground state, we can keep track of the energy. And that is, and I mean, we know that the, the lower the energy, the closer we are to the, the exact ground state in principle. Um, when we are doing the, uh, the time evolution, we, see, we no longer have a metric like this to keep track of. We could compute the fidelity with respect to the exact state, but this is exponentially complex. So we can only do it when, um, when we're working on small systems uh, with respect to which we have the exact solution. Um, you can, it's an open research problem to, to try to find um, metrics and diagnostics that tell you 
that the the step the last step you took um, was was correct and you had a small error. There's a recent article by Damian Hoffman and Giuseppe um, where they propose one such metric, and the idea is the following. So um, you you solve your you solve the linear system, you find the update, you update your parameters by solving this. Now in the new state, if I'm not mistaken, you compute again, you sample again, and you compute the quantum geometric tensor for the new parameters. And then you use this information to check if actually uh, like the distance that you think you traveled according to the quantum geometric tensor that you had computed before is the same that, that you can check with the new quantum geometric tensor in the new position. So if they don't match, for example, this could tell you that uh, something went wrong because you took a larger or smaller step than what you expected. And this is due to the linearization error sampling error in the quantum geometric tensor. Um, you could also investigate the sampling complexity of your state, which might make it so that the, you cannot reconstruct enough, enough information in the quantum geometric tensor. But again, it's an open research problem. So, sorry, can, so, I, can I add something maybe? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so this is, uh, yeah, but just as a simple medic, you can measure the overlap between uh, I mean, the thing that we are optimizing, which is this linearized overlap, this is something that you can measure in principle. And actually, it has a simple expression in terms of the, of the geometric tensor. Uh, then there are extra complications like the one that Filippo was mentioning. But uh, let's say putting aside these extra complications, what you can do is that you can measure the infidelity at each step. And this will give you some idea of what is the variational error at each time step. Yes, sorry. Okay, thanks. So thank you, Giuseppe. So to give you an example, um, here I'm just mm, yeah, loading a bunch of packages, uh, that's not very important, and loading Netcat. Um, I, will, um, I will try to show you the time evolution on, on a transverse field dicing model, which is the same model uh, that you studied yesterday, I think, in the tutorial, in the hands-on. I will be like to have a simulations run fast. I will be working with an extremely small system because my laptop isn't very um, happy otherwise. Uh, but I mean, the idea is that the computational cost will grow polynomially. And so you could do in principle 20, 30, 40, 50 spins if you manage. Um, so yeah, here just to recall a bit a few concepts from Netcat, uh, we have. Um, I'm, I'm defining a graph, so the, the lattice basically. Uh, so this is a, a, a chain with six sides and periodic boundary conditions. I'm building uh, the Hilbert space uh, for spin one alphs, and I have six of them. And uh, I take the Ising Hamiltonian with transverse field uh, equal to 0 0.5, uh, defined on this graph, on this lattice. I will now take um, as a model a restricted Boltzmann machine, and I will choose uh, complex uh, weights. So D type equal complex means that I want the complex to be the, the the weights, the parameters to be complex. And the reason for that is quite important. Um, if I uh, the restricted Boltzmann machine is basically just uh, let's say a dense layer, so some linear transformation of your inputs, uh, parameterized by the parameters that you then feed through some nonlinear activation function. So if your parameters are real, the sigma, so the basis elements that we feed to the networks are real, the output will be real for this particular architecture. Now, the ground state of this Hamiltonian is real. We know it, so that's fine if you're just looking for the ground state. Actually, it's better to use real parameters instead of complex because the computational time like, will be lower because there are less calculations to do. Um, you, you have less issues that might arise with uh, uh, complex uh, neural network ansets. However, when you do the time evolution, you know that even if you start from a very well-defined real state, uh, then you start to add a phase. And so the state will start to evolve. And you need complex numbers to represent this phase. 
So if you don't use complex weights uh, with a restricted Boltzmann machine, you could not study, let's say for, for a restricted Boltzmann machine, you could not study. You could use different architectures, like some you could use one restricted Boltzmann machine for the real part, so for the modulus, and one for the imaginary part, so for the phase. And in that case, you can use uh, real parameters, that's so fine, because you have a way to encode the phase with real parameters. Um, so here I'm taking a very, let's say, even alpha equal two, it would be nicer. Um, I'm using a Metropolis local sampler, so it means that the, the moves are again are proposed by, by flipping one configuration at a time and then checking if, uh, if this can be accepted or, or should be rejected according to the Metropolis hosting acceptance rule. And that's the important part here. I, I did the variational state, right? Um, to give you an example, like how complex numbers, uh, how complex parameters change, if I, if I print just the, um, the array representation of this variational state, um, you will see very soon that I, I'm representing the, the complex nature of the states so of the phase. Instead, if I, was, uh, if I were to use real parameters, you would quickly see that, I mean, there is no way that I can represent phase. Okay, so um, when we initialize the variational state, uh, the, the weights are initialized randomly. So in the case of this network, uh, we are using uh, some truncated normal distribution. So we have no idea what state in the Hilbert space exactly is uh, that we are encoding at the beginning. So since I want to do some time evolution of something that I, that I know, the first thing I will do before doing the time evolution is finding the ground state of a known Hamiltonian. And then I will evolve this state. The reason for that is that um, I don't want to do the time evolution of a random state that I have no idea what it is. I want to find a very well-defined state, and then I want to evolve that one. So the trick we usually employ is that uh, we think about what is the initial state that we want to time evolve. We write up an Hamiltonian, whose ground, a simple Hamiltonian possibly, whose ground state gives me that state. We perform a, time evol a, a ground state search for this state, and then we do the time evolution. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm simply uh, using uh, the stochastic reconfiguration with stochastic gradient descent to find the, um, the ground state of, uh, of the transverse yield Ising model with uh, transverse yield 0 0.5. And later I will take this state and I will evolve it. Of course, not according to this Hamiltonian, otherwise nothing would happen, right? Because it's a ground state, but I will do a quench. So I will change the transverse field to a higher value, 1.5, for example, and I will see what happens. So, yes, so now I run the evolution. I have found um, a fairly good approximation of the ground state. We could even check that against the uh, exact diagonalization, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so now I would like to have some exact data against which to compare the time evolution I will do with Netcat. So the first thing I do is I define an observable that I want to keep track of. It's a sigma x, so the magnetization along the x direction. Uh, what this line does, it's simply I'm summing sigma x over every side and dividing it by the number of sides. And I'm also defining the new Hamiltonian, eight Hamiltonian number two, which is uh, all, still an easing Hamiltonian, but with a higher field, 1.5. So now I will use um, Q-tip. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's one of many quantum physics packages that allow you to uh, solve the Schrodinger equation quite easily. You can use pretty much anything because you can always convert NetGets operators to dense or sparse matrices. 
but I'm very lazy. I don't want to do everything by myself. So I want to use something that is already made up. So what I do is I, I specify the, the time interval that I want to, uh, to study. So from zero to 3.0 with small steps. Um, this is a bit ugly. So here I'm trying to um, write the initial state to define the initial state using Q-tip. So um, basically I'm here, I'm building a Q-tip object, q -obj, uh, starting from the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And then what I'm doing, I'm simply uh, storing uh, inside of this state, in its data, basically, I'm storing the array representation of the vector representation of my, of the state I optimized. So essentially what this code is doing, it's is taking the, the cat, the vector representation of my variational state that I optimized, and I'm putting it inside the Q-tip object. It should be easier to do. It's not. You can complain with Q-tip. Um, Okay, and now I will call a function. That's what I wanted to do from the beginning, uh, from Q-tip, se solve, so Schrodinger equation solve. Uh, so what I'm doing here, I'm passing the, the, the quenched Hamiltonian, so the Hamiltonian with a higher field. Uh, operators in Netcat have a way to convert them to Q-tip objects. So in that case, it's very simple and easy. Eventually, we might have more stuff like that to convert, but it's not there yet. Um, then I'm passing in the initial state, psi zero. I'm passing the time interval that I want to solve for. And I'm passing a list of uh, operators for which I want to compute the expectation value during the time evolution. And, and the operator is, again, sigma x that I composed before. And I'm converting it to a quantum to a Q-tip object. Okay, so this should be clear, I hope. Is it not clear for someone? Good. So now here I simply plot the uh, sigma x, uh, this sigma x time uh, expectation value as a function of time. And you see that um, the initial value was 0 0.2. So it was, it's the sigma x, uh, the magnetization along the x-axis of the ground state I had found. And, and then I have a quench dynamics. Okay, so that's all. It's a boilerplate, nothing interesting there. So now I will get to the interesting part, how to do that with Netcat. Um, essentially, what I want to do is integrate this equation, right? So I have S, S is the quantum geometric tensor. I want to solve this linear system of equations, and then I want to update my parameters. So the first thing I will do is I will store somewhere the initial value of my parameters, just so that if I um, get something wrong, I can always restore them. Okay, when I want to have a copy of my initial parameter somewhere. Um, yeah, here I'm rewriting again the, the same quenched Hamiltonian, that's not very important. And um, okay, so what I can do now is the following. Once you have a variational state, uh, you, you should have seen yesterday that you can compute expectation values by passing an operator, right? Yes, dot expect. You give it an operator, it gives you an expectation value with error and everything else. You can also ask him to give you the expectation value and the gradient. So what you get is, again, the expectation value of this operator, but also the gradient of this operator with respect to the parameters of your variational state, which is this structure of parameters that you get back. And it's the gradient with respect to every parameter. So that's how I can compute this F10, right? This is the gradient of the energy. So this is exactly this object. And now Netcat makes it also extremely easy to get the quantum geometric tensor with a function named quantum geometric tensor. So what it does is that Netcat is very lazy, probably because I'm a very lazy person. And uh, it doesn't really compute the, the geometric tensor, okay? What it returns is an object that will behave as the geometric tensor, but without really having compute the full dense matrix. 
So I will give you an example. Um, I have this S object, okay? Um, this S object um, acts on the space of parameters, basically. So I can, for example, multiply it by W0. W0 are my parameters, right? So what I did here is compute, if you want, Sij times Wj. And uh, so this is kind of a matrix multiplication, right? Because if you think of, uh, of the quantum geometric tensor as a matrix and as the parameters as a vector, this is well-defined. However, it's not doing this as a matrix multiplication exactly because uh, if you look here, like W0, my parameters are stored as a set of dictionaries and lists and, and all the parameters are in different matrices and tensors and, and vectors. So what it's doing, it's, it's doing semantically the same thing, but without really composing the, the matrix and, and, and the vector of, of the whole parameters. Is this clear for everyone? Wow, that's very good. Um, so another thing you can do now is you can actually use uh, linear algebra solvers to solve this system of equations, right? So I can call, do I have loaded JAX? Yes, JAX.scipy.sparse.linalg.conjugate uh, gradients. Uh, I guess that many of you use those solvers from SciPy. And what changes now is that since we are using JAX, um, Basically, pretty much like you have to prefix NumPy with, uh, with JAX, uh, we have to do the same for SciPy. And you can really feed it like your S matrix and, uh, and your parameters, for example. And this will solve the linear system. And you get the solution, right? Um, and, and if you, for some reason, write the linear solver that is extremely good and want to use it with NetKit, to solve this linear system, you can. You just need to write it so that it works with JAX objects and it will work out of the box, which I think is pretty nice. And if for some reason you want to diagonalize uh, the, the quantum geometric tensor, you can also convert it to a dense matrix as pretty much everything else in NetKit and you get the dense matrix representation of it. There is a caveat, which is if your network is uh, non-holomorphic, or if your network has real parameters, you will not get the full quantum geometric tensor, but you will only be getting the real part of it. And uh, I will not get into the reason of why that is so, but it should suffice to say that you only ever need the real, like in most applications we have studied, you only ever need the real part of it. Okay, so, so I, I've shown you how to solve the linear system of equations. Mm. So basically now I just need to solve and update my parameters at every time step, right? Uh, so what I can do is I can take my current parameters. I can, uh, um, I can um, show you here what's going on. So if you ignore for a moment like the boilerplate on top, what is going on here is, well, at every time in the list of times that I want, for which I want to do the time evolution, um, I'm computing the magnetization along the x direction just to keep track of it, and I'm storing it somewhere. So variation state dot expect dot sigma x, and then I take the real part of the mean, and that's just because I don't want to do it later. I compute the quantum geometric tensor. Um, now, the quantum geometric tensor, uh, I told you before, has several eigenvalues that are zero. Therefore, when we solve this linear system of equations, it's all often very handy to add a tiny regular, a small regularization bias on the diagonal, right? So one way to do this is to take S and then add, I don't know, 0 0.001, sorry. And uh, again, what this will do is that it will just do this lazily. It doesn't really add it to the diagonal, but it keeps track of it, and then everything will work as if you had, had added it to the diagonal. So 
that's okay. So that's uh, pretty much uh, here. I'm writing it in another way, but that's basically equivalent. I can also simplify this. Can just say this. Uh, I take the quantum geometric tensor and I add a small regularization bias to the diagonal. Okay. Um, then I compute the gradient of the energy defined by this Hamiltonian, by the quenched Hamiltonian. Um, so this, I'm ignoring the first return value of this function, which is the um, expectation value of the energy. I don't really care about it right now. I'm only looking at the gradient. Then uh, if you remember what, what I was showing before, um, so I, I'm not actually solving S i j delta w j equal to f, but I'm actually solving this system of equations um, minus i f i. I want to multiply my gradient by i. Uh, if you look at the notes yesterday from the calculation that Giuseppe did, you should find this, this term. So what I'm doing here is I'm multiplying my gradients by minus i, right? Um, if you are not familiar with uh, dot tree map, what this is doing is it's taking every array inside uh, inside this nested list and dictionaries of of arrays and it's multiplying every one of them by minus i j. So once I have uh, this transport transformed uh, uh, transform the gradient f. Now I simply want to solve. I will be using my linear system, so I will be uh, calling s dot solve. It's equivalent to using directly uh, your linear solver, just a tiny bit more efficient. So that's what I'm doing. I'm using a GM res solver because it's quite stable, but you can play around and try different ones. I'm uh, I'm taking the gradient and I'm uh, and I'm using as an initial guess for the solution uh, zero, and then I will I will always use as as the as the initial guess of a solution the last solution because I I hope that it doesn't change too much, and this should speed up the solution. And then lastly, what they do is this Jack Tree Multimap. I want to sum my current parameters with the new parameters with the let's say updated with the update delta w. So that's it here, x plus dt times y, right? And I'm multiplying the by the time step. And I update the parameters in my variation state. If I do this, first time it will take a moment to compile it. OK, now it's extremely fast because I'm taking a very large time step. You see 0 0.01 and, uh, and the system is small. You can see that the first steps were very fast, and now it's uh, it's it's slowed down. The reason for that is uh, because uh, sometimes you can enter a region in parameter space where the solution of a linear system is harder, so it has to do more steps in order to find the solution. And now I can plot it, and uh, in this case, uh, you see that I have a, like this is plotting only sigma x, the expectation value of sigma x. You can see that it matches pretty well for the initial, <clears throat> uh, for the first, uh, let's say, up to time equal one, and then we start to have a deviation. So an obvious way to improve on this is to use a smarter uh, integration algorithm. This is basically Euler scheme. We could use uh, Runge Kutta 2 3, for example. Um, I'm not going to do that. Uh, right now, I'm going to do the uh, more, let's say, brutal way, which is just lower the time step. I'm going to use uh, dt equal uh, 0 0.05. And I'm going to store the parameter somewhere, somewhere else. Of course, more parameters means, sorry, smaller time step means more time integration step. It will, it will take longer. But in theory, what we should see is that the solution will be approximated, uh, well approximated up to longer times. 
another thing that can happen is that once you start to integrate uh, your your uh, your uh, your time dependent like using the time dependent variational principle up to long times maybe the uh, the system starts to be very correlated and you need a higher number of uh, hidden units so a higher number of parameters to actually encode your states because uh, right now i have a pretty uh, pretty thin uh, neural network with not many parameters and if i want to represent well my state up to higher times i might need to do that um yep uh, i'm sorry here i i ruined so here i'm gonna plot the first batch of data with where the time step was 0 0.01 here i have 0 0.005 yes <laughs> So you see that the time evolution is correct uh, up to um, slightly longer times. Yeah, we still have an error here. So what I, I, I would guess uh, needs to be done in this case is um, yeah, like there are two things I can try to approach. The first one is this renormalization shift. Uh, the equations are valid for a shift that is zero. However, uh, you will see uh, that uh, with a shift that is zero, either you cannot solve the linear system or you will find very bad solutions or you will not converge. So what I will try to do now is decrease this shift. I will use one minus six. Um, and... Uh, Hopefully, we should find a better solution. This didn't happen. Uh, that's the beauty of live demos. We never work. Um, and it didn't stop before. Why is that? Okay, well, I'll get back to it later. Another thing that we can do, as I said, is increase the number of, like, the width of my neural network. So right now I was using alpha equal two. This means that the number of hidden units in my neural network was two times the number of sides, two n. Uh, this means that my variational state has uh, 90 parameters in this case. I might want to use four, for example. Of course, if I change the structure of my neural network and the number of parameters it has, unless I'm using a very well specific structure where I can change the parameters by hand, I need to re-optimize the initial state because the network is different, right? And, and this is a bit annoying when we work uh, with, those, uh, with, those, uh, with those states, but, uh, but it needs to be done. So in this case, uh, with alpha equal four, I get uh, 174 parameters, I can still uh, find the ground state, <clears throat> and then, yeah, it will take longer, of course, because I have more parameters. And then you can do everything later. Okay, so if you want to play around, uh, basically what I've showed you is that in NetCat already has everything you need to do the time evolution. It's just not, let's say, presented in nice package yet, but, but you can do it yourself if, if you want, if you're interested in the reason we are not yet presenting a uh, simple API to do that is because we would like to find a very nice API uh, built in the solvers, and that, and that didn't happen yet. But hopefully, it will happen rather soon. So, OK, I still have some time. Are there any questions? Yes. So before, where you said that we don't really have a matrix, uh, what happens if we want to access uh, just a specific element? You have to convert. OK, so that's a nice question. Um, so it behaves like a matrix, right? Um, So one way to access a specific element of a matrix is to um, 
multiply it by basis element on the right and the basis element on the left, right? So then, so since you can always multiply efficiently with uh, this lazy matrix, let's say, you can build your parameters, take your parameters vector, put all of them to zero except one entry with a one. This is equivalent, this is basically a basis vector in this basis. And, and then you can do the multiplication and then you, get, you can take the entry you want. The easier way is just take the dense matrix representation and, and find the good one. Um, essentially, it's doing this internally. Like to compute the dense matrix representation, what we are doing is it, we are multiplying it by 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. We are doing all those multiplications and taking the output uh, as a matrix form. So. Yes? Um, so could you use NetGet with continuous Hamiltonians? <laughs> uh, not yet. Uh, there is a PhD student in the group that is uh, working on that, but we are, we are slowly building in support for this. So like right now we have, uh, we can define continuous silver spaces. Uh, very soon you will be able to define continuous Hamiltonians. Once this is the, we, we have uh, continuous space samplers already implemented, like extremely experimental, but they are there. Um, the difference is that basically you're, you're now sampling the space of basis elements. So instead of having like spins like one, one and minus one, one zeros, um, you have, I don't know, like the position in, in, in real space. And, and then, I don't know, one very simple way to, to propose moves is to um, generate the shift like that is a Gaussian around zero and, and then accept and reject. And everything else works out of the box. Um, so eventually it will come. It's a, <clears throat> it's a hard problem because um, the kinetic term in, in a continuous system, Hamiltonian, um, involves a second derivative, right? And the second derivative, also known as the Hessian, is a bit uh, of a chimera in machine learning because everybody would like to use it, but nobody really wants to use it because it's very heavy to compute. So I think um, it's an interesting research direction. It, the, there's a lot of, let's say, work to be done uh, both in NetKit or in, like, if you want to study this uh, to make it work because it, it, it's computationally hard. So maybe you could do use the Fourier transform to move <coughs> from the X space to the moment space. And then there wouldn't have to be the Hessian, you just multiply it and it's work. But then you have the potential term. Yeah. Which you will still have to, which will not be maybe a second order derivative, but might be a first order derivative. Um, no, I mean, like you compute the Fourier transform, you multiply times p squared, and then you do the inverse Fourier transform and you go back to the x space. Um, yes, but maybe it's less efficient than actually. So you cannot, not, the point is, is you cannot really do the Fourier transform of your, uh, of your ansatz. I mean, you can in principle, if you compute it on every point, but you can't because you want to avoid that, right? Oh, okay. So it, it, I, I'm saying this is something you could study. I mean, uh, maybe you can try to find I mean, it's a valid approach. You discretize your space, you compute uh, your ansets in some points, and it's a valid approach. I'm not sure it would work uh, because, uh, I mean, we're working in a high dimensional space, so, but it's something that can be tried. You can also do approximations on the hash and on, on the kinetic term, of course, you can, there's a lot of things to try. And uh, I think that it's a very, it's already a young field and, uh, and going to continuous systems is something that many people would like to do, but we... Okay, thank you very much. Yes.
Uh, is there any workaround to time evolve arbitrary initial states, not the ground state of a certain Hamiltonian? It's uh, related to what I said before, right? So you can evolve anything. I mean, the only thing I did here was I did I solved an initial optimization problem here to find a state that I know what it is. So because if I give you, if I tell you my answer is a restricted Boltzmann machine and I give you some parameters, can you tell me what state it is in the Hilbert space? No. Exactly. So I solve a, an optimization problem and, and I know that the solution of this optimization problem is a state that I like, that I want to time evolve, that I'm interested in. Uh, and then I do the time evolution. So it's relatively simple to cook up, to write an Hamiltonian that, that gives you a state you're interested in. For example, you want all spins up, okay? I mean, it's, you just write an Hamiltonian that gives you something that is polarized in that direction and, and the optimization will be relatively simple, so. Okay, thank you. Does this answer the question? Can you comment on the difference between using complex parameters or real parameters and then outputting real part and imaginary part? Like is one more efficient than the other or? Um, as far as I know, it, it has not been proven yet if one is more efficient than the other. I don't know if Giuseppe is aware of any article that uh, studied the difference. It's something we often talk about it's uh, it's an interesting question. Mm, I don't know, Giuseppe, do you know of any article that actually studied it that I'm not aware of? Okay, I think he left us. Um, <laughs> so as far as I know, there is uh, like, there are, nobody did a, a precise study on that. My personal, intuitive understanding, but take it with a grain of salt, is that if you have, um, it, if you know the sign structure of your Hamiltonian, for example, at least for ground states, it's easier. So if you know the ground structure of, uh, of this, if this sign structure of, of your ground state, it's easier to enforce it by hand or or, or optimize the, the, the imaginary part of the neural network that gives you the sign structure beforehand and then optimize the, the amplitude independently. And this works better. It's easier to solve this optimization problem, like first a smaller one and then the other one, than solving the full optimization problem of the sign and the amplitude at the same time. So using complex numbers. But for time evolution, I, I don't know. Okay, so um, I can actually, I can do a break now if you want. Um, and I can resume after by giving you some examples on using symmetries and maybe mentioning uh, uh, dissipative systems or we can push a bit forward now, what do you want? Uh, is everyone here? Okay, um, so now I would like to briefly talk, apparently we used a lot of time before, I would like to briefly talk about how to encode symmetries in neural quantum states. Um, the reason I want to do this is that I want to reduce the number of parameters in my neural network and improve uh, uh, the accuracy of my results. So symmetries are a very, uh, let's say, cheap way of doing that. So um, what is a symmetry? I just give a very brief uh, flash of what I mean by it. Um, I'm not going to talk about representation theory and group theory, so it would be very nice, but there is no time to take another course, like six hours on it. Um, so by symmetry, I mean that imagine you have a group. Um, 
a group of linear transformations that act on your Hilbert space. And now if those transformations leave invariant your Hamiltonian, meaning that they all commute with the Hamiltonian, then in this case, I, I would say that your Hamiltonian has a symmetry. To give you a very simple example, um, the Hamiltonian we were studying before, like uh, Ising on a chain, um, if you if you invert the ordering of your of your sides, the Hamiltonian, like in its matrix representation, doesn't change. It's exactly the same. You're just changing the way you address the single the single uh, qubits, but uh, the single spins. But but basically, the Hamiltonian is not changing. The, the simple the simple symmetries we have in those lattice systems are usually translation symmetry, uh, rotation symmetry if you're in 2D or higher, um, inversion symmetry or reflections, and all the compositions of those. Uh, that's called point group. There are people that study these, especially in crystallography. And and the interesting thing is that you will know very well, but uh, once we have uh, like a symmetry, so an operator that a set of operators that commutes with my Hamiltonian, I can use this information to actually uh, simplify uh, the system I want to solve. So I could diagonalize a smaller matrix, for example, if I want to find the ground state. Um, what I'm interested in is uh, is this line, basically. So if there is a symmetry. It is possible to show that since the Hamiltonian commutes with a set of operators, then also the ground state must be left invariant by those transformations, meaning that the amplitude for a certain configuration sigma prime must be equivalent to. So sigma prime is obtained by some transformation, like let's say a translation by a vector r uh, of another state. And if, if, this is uh, this is a symmetry of my Hamiltonian, then those two amplitudes must be the same. So now the question comes. Uh, if I know that the ground state must fulfill this condition, um, why should the network optimize its weights by itself in order to find it? Because I already know it. So I want to enforce it in my network, right? This will uh, This means that the network will have fewer parameters, and that by construction, everything would be translational invariant. So the way we, we, we can do it, uh, the, an extremely simple way to do it is just take my network and, and sum it many times um, for every possible translation. So think about it. If I have, if I have a bit string, like let's say up, down, up, down, and I want to compute this amplitude, um, and I'm very lazy, and I don't want to uh, change very much my network architecture. I want to still use the restricted Boltzmann machine. What I can do is simply um, say that the output of my network is the sum of of the network evaluated for this bit string, and then the the network evaluated for this bit string translated by one, then translated by two, etc. For all the symmetries of my system. So basically, I, I will build this invariant um, invariant ansatz where I will be computing my my amplitudes for a spin, that for a bit string like up down up down, and then I will sum it with the one where I do it for down up down up, and, and then so on and so forth. And and the output is by construction invariant, right? So in general. What, what we do in NetKit is that um, what you can do in machine learning is that you can try to build a, a dense layer, so basically a matrix, that, that fulfills, this fulfills this condition. And this is what we did in, uh, in NetKit. So because we didn't find any, anybody had done this properly uh, on the past internet. Uh, and so we did it ourselves. So, I think you should have seen it um, yesterday. Uh, let's see, I don't have it here. <laughs> Sorry, just give me a second. <laughs> OK. 
Um, Yes. Okay. Um so what I want to show you is this. Uh, maybe some of you have seen it yesterday. I'm just gonna comment on it again. Um, I want to show you the difference between using basically an RBM. So here, what I did is I defined um, a very simple, uh, model using flux. I want to show you the difference between uh, what happens if I use uh, a full RBM, so with a full dense layer, which means I have this big matrix of size and number of spins times alpha n. In this case, um, if I build uh, this whole object, it would take a while to compute. Of course, you know that the number of parameters would be roughly alpha n squared, so it will increase Instead, uh, by enforcing symmetries, we can reduce that uh, roughly by the square number, uh, square the number of symmetries that we are enforcing. So if all of these loads, I want to show you a few things. Um, well, right, okay, good. So you can see that here again, uh, Yes, oh, oh, times. Yes, okay. So here, uh, what I'm building is a, a, a dense layer, right? With a uh, number of hidden features equal to alpha with hidden unit density times the number of parameter of the Hilbert space size. So that's uh, the last dimension of the input. And you can see here that uh, for alpha equal four, I have 1,680 parameters. I'm working with 20 spins here. Now, uh, if we take the graph uh, of my system, this is um, a chain again, right? NetCAD includes uh, a lot of utilities to work with a, with a discrete symmetries on this graph. In particular, uh, you can automatically get the translation group, the group of translations. So you see uh, this, is, um, this is the group of, uh, of transformation given by the identity, uh, translation by one, translation by two on the chain, translation by three, et cetera, et cetera, until translation by 19. Um, you can get the group of rotations. Of course, in, uh, in one dimension, there are no rotations, so that only contains the identity. But if you were to work uh, in, in two dimensions, you could get this. You can even get the full point group, I think. Yes, you can get the full point group. So that's, uh, that's a group made up of all the possible symmetries of a lattice, not only translations and rotations, but also axial symmetries and everything else. And uh, there, there, there's a guy in, in Oxford that, uh, that de developed most of this functionality because he's very interesting in it, interested in it. Now, what they would like to do now is simply take the translation group, the group of translations, and enforce them. So the way you do it in NetCat is, uh, is relatively simple. You use this layer called the dense symmetric sim, dense sim. Uh, you pass it a set of symmetries, so these objects. Of course, again, 
I'm only talking about discrete symmetries. Like continuous symmetries are wonderful, but it's still a huge open problem how to properly encode them in a neural network. So I'm only talking about discrete lattice symmetries now. The way this works is that it converts the, the translation group to, to a matrix. Okay. So basically, um, it, it describes it as a, as a permutation, as a permutation matrix of a certain size. I think I can show you. Yes, two array. Basically, what this matrix does is uh, maybe I can do it for a smaller graph. Basically, what this does is um, uh, this is the translation group for a chain of six pins. Uh, it basically tells you that the identity is like if you give it some bit string, some configuration, like the identity transformation will just give it back everything. Like those are indices. So it will not permute it in any way. Um, the translation by one to the right will give you something where you, like you shift the indices by one, by two and so on and so forth. And you, you can get the same. Um, and every, like this works for any symmetry group defined on a lattice. So essentially, symmetries that are easy to work with in NetKit are symmetries that you can write as somehow as this matrix, as a permutation matrix. If you can't, uh, I'm sure that we can, like someone can come up with a way to do it, but uh, but nobody did it yet, at least in that case. Okay, so so what you see here, I pass it uh, the translation group, but then internally gets converted to this matrix. You could also just pass it like a permutation uh, permutation matrix. You choose a number of features, so that's very important. Um, the number of features is basically telling you how many. So like uh, in a standard dense layer, the output layer is uh, has a number of hidden units that is equal to the input size times some hidden layer density. Now we are trying to reduce the size of our system. So the output size of, uh, of my layer will be basically the number of uh, symmetries that I have. So in this case, I have 20 sides. So I have 20, uh, let's say the size of this uh, symmetry group is 20. And so I will have uh, 20 outputs by default, and you can multiply it by alpha so to increase the density. Uh, of course, if, you're, if your ground state is very simple, you, you can just use uh, alpha equal one, and then you can improve it, increase it. So if you do this, uh, the interesting thing that you will see is that there are only 84 um, 84 parameters. So we went from 1,680 to 84. And, and that's remarkable. Uh, this also means that uh, like the quantum geometric tensor will be much smaller, so you can diagonalize it easier and more easily. And, uh, and hopefully, also, your optimization will be simpler. Um, one last note, like this uh, dense symmetric layer, it's essentially a convolution where the kernel of the convolution is as wide as your, your system itself, right? Because a convolution is translational invariant by definition, essentially, uh, what we are doing is we are taking huge convolutions across the whole system and, and, and moving the convolution window. That's another way of seeing it. Just that our implementation is more general because if you cannot write your, um, your your symmetries as convolutions, like maybe because you're working on the triangle on the triangular lattice or the Kagomi lattice, then then our implementation is a bit more general. Of course, using convolutions will be faster. So there there are switches in in here. You can consult the documentation of NetKit, and you could tell him like mode equal FFT, and he will use fast Fourier transform convolutions, which will be even faster. Of course, this doesn't work all the time. It depends on what on on what's the structure of your image. So, with that said, we can also optimize this. Um, we can also optimize this. It will take time. 
uh, essentially um, the nice thing of of the output that we will find is that uh, it's it's by definition it will be translational invariant. So that's so you don't need to worry to enforce it. You don't need to like average over the whole uh, lattice in your observables and so on and so forth. Now, this is a very simple network, right? Um, that's just one layer. What if you want to go deeper? What if you want to have many layers, right? What if you want to have a deep network? So there's a very interesting article by uh, Christopher Roth and uh, in Texas, I think in Austin and uh, his PI, um, where they where they generalize the uh, one structure, one uh, neural network structure that is called the uh, group convolutional neural network, and they used it in um, for quantum states, so with Netgate and neural quantum states. The idea of the group convolutional neural network is that if you want to enforce symmetries in 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 your network, this is like what I've shown you uh, works for the first layer. And then all the layers that come after can like don't need to care anymore about enforcing the symmetries because you've already done it on the first layer. But then you might want to enforce the symmetry also in like preserve the symmetry also in all the intermediate layers. The reason you might want to do this is uh, to target excited states. So when I wrote this, um, this is only true if you have a very simple, only if you're targeting ground states, right? Because uh, if you want to target, like in, in lattice systems, it is possible to um, target excited states by looking at the symmetries of your system. So to be a bit more precise, um, in general, we have a property that tells me that if my system has a certain symmetry, so if my Hamiltonian commutes with a certain group, um, then my states should respect this formula, this invariance formula, where you will see it's the same formula I wrote before, but now I added a chi of r in front of it. So basically the previous case was chi of r equal one for every r labeling my symmetries. And, and now I'm saying this chi can take on any value. Um, if you know group theory, chi is the character of a reducible representation. If you don't know group theory, what I'm saying is that excited states of your system uh, labeled by a wave vector k with a certain momentum must be written, must respect the symmetry where every time you apply a certain translation operator, you get a phase. And this phase depends on the wave vector of, of that state. So basically the previous case was the ground state, which has k equal to zero, right? So this is one for every value. Now, if I want to study an excited state that for example, k equal pi, I just put k equal pi here and uh, my, basically depending on the, I can compute those values. It will be basically one minus one, one minus one, one minus one, so on and so forth. And now I can try to enforce this property on my neural network. So while enforcing chi of r equal to one, it's very simple because you just need to worry about the first layer in your neural network and then you don't care anymore about nothing. If you you can add any other layer later. If you want to enforce these for, for one of the excited states, then you need to care about and you need to preserve some sort of uh, some properties in your neural network, uh, which is called equivariance. So you want that your first layer, the one that we cooked up before, uh, gives you something like that. And when you want the, all the layers that come later, they preserve this character, this, this structure. So the way this can be done in NetKit, it's uh, very simple. Um, Christopher was very nice and uh, he decided to contribute uh, the code of his article to NetKit. So there is now a, a model that is already built in, but you can also just take the pieces 
called the group convolutional neural network. And what it does, it takes a graph. So the graph of uh, describing your symmetry. Um, you could even just pass it the translation group or whatever else you want. And then you can pass in the characters. That, that, so it was, the, the, was chi of her. And from that, it will compute, uh, like it will automatically target one state or another. So I, I'll give you an example. If my computer doesn't, yeah. So, so here it's the usual boilerplate. Uh, I have a group. I have a graph now. Um, the way you can access all the group uh, theory related objects is by accessing the space group builder object. But it's just boilerplate. Uh, hopefully, we will get rid of this. But right now, that's how it works. Uh, so. This space group builder allows you to compute, uh, mm, to, to list all the symmetries and their characters on the, on the system. So if, um, if you like a group theory and you, you know what those objects are, you can access, for example, the little group of a certain, of a certain, uh, of a certain K and then uh, get its character table and so on and so forth. I will now just try to give you like a very simple usage for it, which is, um, so if you want to target an excited state, essentially what you want to, uh, to do is take the space group of a certain K wave vector. So for example, the, the ground state is K equals zero. So you do this by space group in reps because this gives you very reducible representations. You pass it the wave vector. In our case is zero for the ground state. And if you see here, it is giving you the characters of, of this wave vector, which would be all ones. Actually, it turns out that uh, due to the specific symmetry in the system, you can, uh, like, this is kind of equivalent to having one minus one, one minus one. Uh, but they will not get into the reason why. So now, if we want to have pi instead, so what we have here is that the, the specific characters are one, one, minus one, minus one, 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 minus one, minus one. The reason that we have these, uh, those values is mostly due to the ordering by which we order uh, the symmetries internally. So you have to be careful to match them. But if you use NetCat to build those objects, you don't need to care about it. So what they do here is I take the character of the ground state, so here for zero, I pass those characters to the group convolutional neural network, and uh, I specify some the number of features. I mean, I just need four, and the number of layers. The ground state we know it's real, so I can use just uh, the real uh, parameters, and we can run the optimization. Of course, this is a fairly heavyweight uh, technique, a fairly heavyweight architecture, so. Uh, it takes a long time to compile it. That's why you will see that it stays at zero for like one minute. And, and then it will be slower than just using an RDM. However, then I will show you when, when this is done that we can use the same structure to target the first excited state. Of course, if your excited state now have, has phases, you might need to switch to complex numbers eventually. Like, like before, if we want to do the time evolution, we needed them. We might also need them now. Yeah, so you see that it works very well. And if we want to target, for example, the first excited state, uh, we simply use, uh, we ask, like, sorry, the, the, we want to compute the energy of the, of the state uh, with, uh, with vector pi, we can do this then everything is the same. Uh, I did so for feature and two layers. To give you an, an idea, like one, Like in this case, we are using 224 um, parameters. And the reason for that is because, I mean, we have four times the number of symmetries. So 
on the first layer and then we have some uh, dense layers later, like two layers after. So we can also optimize this one. Again, it will take a while. But, but the, the beauty of this is that it allows you to, to study excited states of the lattice system, which usually with like, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but matrix product states uh, are harder to use to compute states beyond the first excited state. So you could do the first, maybe the second, but then it starts to be a bit harder. Yeah, for example, here it's not working, right? Because we have the energy is not a number. I believe it is because I was using uh, real um, parameters. I'm going to switch to complex. An important thing when you, when you train those very complex networks is that very often you will find that they are untrainable with standard stochastic gradient descent. So you will fall into a um, local minima. However, if you use stochastic reconfiguration, you will you will manage to find the, the, the ground state. I will I will give you an example now. Uh, so the ground state of so here, for example, you see that in less than a hundred iterations, we found this excited state. I, I know this because I can see that the variance is zero. And uh, by the zero variance principle, you know that if the variance is zero, uh, you are on an eigenstate. So that's very nice. Um, this was using stochastic reconfiguration. If I, if I don't use stochastic reconfiguration, um, yeah, sorry, I have to reset my parameters. Okay, if I don't use stochastic reconfiguration, I also do converge. So that's bad luck. But yesterday didn't converge. <laughs> but so in general, what I'm saying is um, stochastic reconfiguration really helps when you have a lot of parameters and the complex architecture, especially at the beginning and at the end to improve it. Okay. Um, with that, I would like, uh, how long do I have? I have the last 10 minutes. I would like to flash, let's say maybe 15 minutes. Um, I would like to flash uh, one last topic, um, which are open quantum systems. I know that a few in the audience uh, study the, the subject. It's uh, like, I come from a background in open quantum systems. So what are open quantum systems um, and why are they interesting? The open systems are basically the study. So until now I studied closed systems, right? Uh, like this, you assume that your system is isolated. Uh, there is no, um, there is no interaction between the system and the environment. The Hamiltonian tells you everything. However, this is not what happens in, in the reality, right? Even your quantum computers that now everyone loves talking about, they, uh, they are noisy, they are coupled to the environment, there is thermal radiation, there is, there is leakage, there are a lot of problems. Photons can never be isolated and, and, and locked in a, in a black box, they leak out. So open systems, basically, uh, what we call open systems is the study of those uh, systems that are coupled to the environment and try to understand what happens due to this coupling and how it changes the dynamics of the system. Uh, in general, like the interesting things we can study uh, is related to, I mean, you all know that we can study very easily like thermal buffs. So when my system is coupled to thermal buff, what happens, like uh, how the system relaxes to its thermal state. Um, however, we want to go to more general systems, like not only thermal systems, like systems coupled to thermal buffs. We want to study systems that are driven out of equilibrium. So maybe I have a thermal buff, but I'm also trying to pump energy into my system, like with a laser or with some overfield to, to drive him far from his thermal ground state. I also might want to be interested in studying what happens with parametric buffs. So, Thermal buffs means that your system can exchange one particle or one excitation at a time with the environment. 
But what if the system can exchange only two excitations at a time with the environment? That's not a thermal buff. And that's very interesting because then you can use it to enforce some symmetries in your systems. Like imagine um, if you engineer a system that can only exchange two excitations at a time with a buff, then, then the parity is conserved, right? The parity of the number of excitations in the system is conserved. And so you could use it to encode the a qubit. So like, it's a very interesting field. And, and like it, it's genuinely useful for quantum information. So I will just skip a bit through the, here. There are many uh, interesting applications like Sholkov working on those parity encoded qubits, uh, uh, superconducting circuits. People sometimes try to understand what happens to them uh, within the framework of open systems instead of just saying, hey, it's thermal noise, because it's not thermal noise. People try to do biology with it, even if the field is now a bit vanishing into a lack of publication after a few very high profile nature articles. Um, so yeah, and then inside of those open systems, we can study dissipative phase transitions, uh, and a lot like many other things I don't have the time to talk about. But so that's the interesting thing. So what, what operatively what happens? So instead of studying a pure state, so a cat, a psi, right, a wave function, I'm going to move to a space where I work with density matrices. Reason for that is, so if you have your system and the environment, and if you knew exactly what's the configuration of the environment, then that's fine, that's a pure state. But you don't know the configuration of the environment. So you trace over all possible, you sum over all possible configurations of it, and you get the density matrix. That's a collection of pure states with some probability. So again, I'm just going to flash this. Uh, um, that's the master equation. So this is a bit like the Schrodinger equation, but for density matrices in open systems. So the idea is that you have, uh, um, so you have this first term that gives you the coherent evolution. So that, if you think about it, this is exactly the Heisenberg equation of motion for the density matrix. So this is what you know, what everyone knows very well. What I'm doing now, I'm adding this very ugly looking uh, term that does incoherent evolution. So basically, those L operators are uh, some operators that describe how your system is coupled to the environment. And usually, they are just like for thermal buffs, those would be one particle exchange operators. For non thermal buffs, those are like, I don't know, like two, uh, two particle exchange operators. And then you can cook up like crazy things uh, depending on what you want to do. So again, the coherent term, you all know about it. This incoherent term is ugly and creates problems. Essentially, what it does is it makes sure that if you have a thermal buff, you converge to your thermal ground state, but then the Gibbs matrix that you know. If you don't have thermal, then uh, you converge to other states. So since this is very ugly, we write it like this. And we say this is the Liouvillian L. It's an operator that is super operator that acts on the density matrix and its action is like that thing that I don't want to write anymore. And essentially, so as much as like when you do open, closed systems, so quantum mechanics, you usually look at the ground state. What we do is we look at the steady state. So the state that is not evolving anymore, right? Because if L rho is zero, that means the time derivative is zero. So it means that the state is stationary. Another way to look at it is uh, we evolve to very long times. We, according to like this uh, dissipative evolution, and eventually the system doesn't evolve anymore. That's my steady state. In general, for most Hamiltonians that people study, and for most dissipations people study, there is always a steady state, at least one, and it's uh, there is only one. You can have what we call dissipative symmetries, so these kind of symmetries where the dissipator preserves some quantity in the system, and then you have two steady states, uh, and that's where things get very interesting, but I will not talk about it. So the big question, and that's really what I would like to leave you uh, as a souvenir uh, to end my talk a bit, is uh, how do we encode mixed states with neural networks, right? Because pure states, it's easy. Um, we encode the logarithm of a wave function. We could also encode the wave function itself, the amplitudes. And, and basically, if you go, 
I don't know, if you go to a restaurant and you find a kid and you ask him, give me a neural network and he gives you a neural network. Like he doesn't know anything about physics. He's a kid mathematician, he gives you a neural network. And regardless of what he tells you, this is a valid pure state because, uh, I mean, okay, it's not normalized probably because he doesn't know about quantum physics, but, but, it's, norm but, but it's okay, we can normalize by, by ourselves. So whatever the architecture and whatever the parameters, it's valid. It's a valid state. Maybe it's not symmet translational invariance. Okay, we can encode it, but I mean, in principle, it's okay. When we do mixed states, we're trying to encode this object, for example, the logarithm of a density matrix uh, entries. Now you cannot do this anymore, right? Because this object uh, must be Hermitian and this object must be positive definite and this object must preserve, have some properties. And, uh, and so this very same kid that is a genius mathematician but doesn't know quantum physics, he gives you an architecture and now this architecture uh, probably will not encode those properties. An alternative way to do this that is very interesting is to use uh, what we call uh, POVNs. So basically kind of... Uh, you're saying that your density matrix is a collection of measurements, so operators that you could measure times the probability to measure that, that, that result. And this is, uh, again, this is very nice because it's a very physical interpretation. This P is a probability distribution. So we go back to uh, being able to ask the kid for architecture and they always work. But this, uh, I mean, basically, this is also not positive definite because. It's emission, but not positive definite because P, P of A, because this architecture is not enough to encode it. So yeah, uh, this is the huge space of the, of uh, matrices, uh, and, but I only want to encode this, right? This small space, positive definite objects. So how to do it? Um, very quickly. Um, the, the most stupid way to, to write a neural network that gives you a density matrix is to say, Okay, I have um, so I have two entries, sigma and theta, and I just apply a dense layer to see to to the row. Sigma is row indices, theta is column indices, and I apply a dense layer to both. And then I use the usual architectures. In other terms, this right. So you have this like this is the row indices. Those are the column indices. Here I multiply them by by a certain uh, by a matrix. Here by another matrix, and layer, and then everything else is the same as always. This is neither emission nor uh, positive definite. There is a way to enforce emissionity. I mean, it's very simple, right? You say I switch was true, and and I just add the complex conjugation to it. So what you can do is say, well, u is equal to like u. This is u, and this is u star. Then by construction, basically, if you switch was true, it's fine. So an interesting question is uh, what we were saying before, right? So this, uh, I can enforce it uh, on, on the first layer, but then I would like to preserve it on, like automatically it's preserved for later layers. But, uh, but positive definiteness instead, uh, it's interesting because for this particular arch architecture, uh, it will be enforced, but if you start to add layers later, it's not enforced anymore. So it's an open problem to try to find um, to try to find deep networks that can represent uh, density matrices. Because right now the best we can do roughly is to use those very shallow restricted walls machine. We can complicate them a bit, but essentially it's the same idea. We just add another term that represents some pure states to it, but really nothing fancy. So it's uh, it's uh, something that people are studying. So now, uh, what what do we do, right? Like for ground state, like what Giuseppe explained to you much better than me, um, is that, I mean, we are optimizing the energy and we know that the energy, like it, basically our cost function has a global minima that will be very close to the ground state. So what they say, it's uh, quite similar. I say, right, like this L operator, L row, I, I want to find the object for which it is zero. So I can just uh, construct a cost function that is uh, row dagger L dagger L row, which kind of is equivalent to saying uh, um, L dagger L is my Hamiltonian. 
the reason we do this is that the Liouvillian is not Hermitian. So its expectation value is not real. I want something that is real so that I can optimize it. And, and this is something you can do. So basically, you can really show that uh, if I take basically L dagger L as some kind of Hamiltonian, even if it's not really an Hamiltonian, then the ground state of this Hamiltonian will have energy zero. And that's the global minima, and uh, everything else will be above it. So I can optimize this energy and find the ground state. And uh, the ground state of this Hamiltonian would be the steady state of my system. It's just that basically you reshape, you go from having the density matrix as a huge vector to some matrix. So a few years ago, uh, yeah, that's the last thing I'm going to flash, is uh, we studied always this transverse field IZ model everyone studies all the time. Um, but we added like those dissipation operators. So basically, we say that every once in a while, one of those pins is T excited. So it's, and, and we lose the excitation. So, like, what happens essentially is that you see, like, here I'm optimizing this cost function. The very nice thing in open systems is that I know what is the target energy. I know it's zero. So, um, so it goes down, that's log scale. And uh, you see that the more it goes down, the more observables converge to this horizontal line that is the exact state that uh, someone else computed for me with MPS. And, and then we did a study. So we varied uh, some, like the transverse field, and we were looking at various observables and com comparing them to exact states. And uh, something ugly happened. Uh, we are not able to have it converge perfectly in this intermediate region. And, and the reason is the following, or one of the reasons is the following. When you have a pure state, a pure state might have zeros in it, right? Uh, it has some zeros, and uh, and encoding zeros in a neural network is a hard problem. Because we are working in log space, to have a zero in the wave function, we need to have minus infinity as the output of our neural network, right? Because exponential of minus infinity is zero. So to get minus infinity, I mean, minus infinity is a large number. So it turns out that, I mean, you don't need minus infinity. Numerically, you can get away with minus five, six. But your network doesn't want to go there. Like, that's a large number for your parameters that are more around 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And now I'm working with density. So like, zeros are, are you don't want to have zeros. So we employ tricks, uh, like uh, if we know that uh, some spin, co spin configurations, bit string, uh, have, must have zero amplitudes, we enforce it at the sampling level. So we never feed the network those configurations. Because, so basically, so we enforce it as probability of sampling it is zero, but we don't ask the network to learn it. Now the problem is with density matrix, you have a square of a number of zeros and, and you must enforce it. And, and what's worse, we don't have a clear, very clear way of identifying them and knowing where they are just by with a sampling, for example, when we sample rows and columns indices. So what is happening there is that in this region, we have almost a pure state. So the density mat with a lot of like some correlations and, and this state has very few zeros and that's nice. So when we square it, there are still very few zeros. In this region, my state is very mixed and, and like horizontal, like it's on that direction. And, and I like this architecture can still represent it well. But in this intermediate region, what is happening is that the state has to go from an extremely pure state to a mixed state. And several zeros start to appear. And the network is not able to, to learn it very well. Like it kind of can, but, but also fails. So late, this was uh, two years ago, plus. What happened was that uh, later people uh, realized that by using this uh, POVM structure that they flushed before, this one, um, they could improve on our results very well and, and get it to match. However, this only works if you have a very, very, 
it's a somewhat mixed state because this technique works when your states are very local. There are not many, there is not too much correlation. Them. And, and therefore, like they could improve on our result, but it's not yet super general, right? So it's it, very nice, at, at least to me, that I can come from this background, from this field. Uh, open questions in neural network that is still to be addressed is how to properly study encode and represent the density matrices and do that like the time evolution can be done i don't have the time to show you but basically the equations that you have are the same that you've seen before you just replace the hamiltonian with a lubillian and everything works fine so if any of you wants to tackle a hard problem it is still open this is okay um yeah, so I don't have time. So with that, I would like to thank uh, uh, Giuseppe and uh, here is our group like Patrick and uh, the bunch of people that uh, like in this photo that contributed to NetKit because now I, I'm, I, I oblige some of the PhD students to, to work a bit on NetKit, uh, in particular uh, like Giuseppe supervise everything, Clemens and a bunch of people on the side. Um, uh, worked on the quantum geometric tensor. One of them is working on continuous systems. Yeah. So the last things I, I showed uh, on dissipative systems were done in my previous group, and I still work on them with Giuseppe now, together with Cristiano and Alberto Biella. And with that, I'm done. So if there are any questions about the first part or this later part, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, any questions? Yes. Hi. Um, so in this last bit of encoding density matrices, yeah. I was wondering whether you could uh, try to find an encoding that is the, you know, this classical probability distribution over pure states and treat it as an ensemble of pure states uh, that you encode with. Neural yes, you can. Uh, the problem is that, for example, for this particular system, um, here, for a very low field, uh, no, sorry. OK, no, that's not a good plot. But so it works if the system is very, is not mixed, right? So if your state is pure, yes. You just have one pure state and you add some probability. If your state is almost pure, you take two or three states and that's fine. So there are several people, also Keelan had a poster here, I think, where he is proposing to do so exactly. So if you want to simulate a quantum computer, I mean, a quantum computer, you want it to be almost pure. So just keeping like two or three states should be fine. Um, personally, for me, I'm interested in some quantum optical systems where this is not enough. Uh, also, because in, I mean, there are other techniques that work well in the very mixed regime. There is no technique that works very well in the intermediate region. And that's what I would like to study. Because it's where uh, you have uh, what we call dissipative phase transitions. So basically, a phase transition between a regime where uh, the Hamiltonian pure dynamics are, uh, are like compete with the dissipative dynamics. But then, so. Um, my intuition is that for a very pure state, you would need very few of these pure states. And then for the other one, you would need a lot. So this approach would kind of work kind of badly. But then in this intermediate region, you could take an ensemble of like, I don't know, 20, 50, I don't know. But, uh, but um, so the number of states you take gives you a bounded, like it gives you the maximum rank of the density matrix you can represent. The rank is related by uh, by by relationship to the entropy of a state that you can encode. So what you're saying is basically you have an encoding that is entropy bounded. But I would like to study states that are entropy unbounded. Yeah, okay. But yes, indeed, it's a you can. And there are people in the audience that are studying it that way. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much.
I was interested in uh, as how to um, how many parameters your models have if you really want to push things. Okay, so you're. I never pushed things uh, crazily. I make other people push things crazily. Um, so I think there are two answers to that question. Um, there are some groups that show that you can solve problems uh, using millions of parameters and using stochastic, uh, sorry, you don't use stochastic reconfiguration or the quantum geometric tensor, but you just use stochastic gradient descent or uh, Adam, these kind of optimizers, and it works. However, it is my deep belief uh, that we don't need that many parameters. Like, okay, the Hilbert space is huge, yes, indeed, but I think we can do much better with few parameters. It's just that we need to cook up the good architecture. So now, when when in the things I do, where I try to use more often stochastic reconfiguration, of course, we're kind of limited up to five, 6,000 parameters. Probably now we could push it to 10, 12,000. But uh, you can do, uh, there are people doing, I don't know, 20 by 20 lattices. Um, in principle, you could push it up forward. It takes a lot of computing time. Uh, I mean, let's say, I think like a restricted Boltzmann machine, what I showed, I think you could safely run it for a thousand spins. Just that there is, no interest in doing so, right? I mean, the model is simple. So once you start, once you have very tough models, you always study them uh, at a small scale and see what happens. Eh? Thank you. I don't know if there are more questions, but I would suggest we, we find Filippo in the coffee break and we ask them there. So let's thank Filippo again for the nice talk. Thanks. Thank you.